everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new here, hi, my name's Claire and this is Yoli. I make videos all about houseplant care, sharing tips and tricks that I've learned over the years to help keep your plants happy and healthy. And I've just got home from a week away and in the time that I was away there was a heat wave so I've got a lot of plants that are really not in a very good way. Also I don't know if you can tell behind me but some of the growth in this room has just kind of exploded in the time that I've been away so I've got a lot of things to do so I thought I would get the camera rolling, have a chat with you guys as I do it and yeah I hope you enjoy it. Let's get into it. I'll start off by showing you some updates. These are not good updates. I have got some good updates as well, but I'll leave them for further on in the video if I if I have time. But hmm, let's start with my jewel orchid. So this is one that obviously just hasn't made it. It was propagating in water and this room, oh my goodness, at the best of times, this room is so, so, so warm because it's literally all glass. It's, it's a greenhouse and the water just completely evaporated when I was away and it's just, it's, it's, turned to that and now it's going to go in the bin. So that's such a shame. I'm really, really sad about that. The soil actually, hang on, I'll show you. The soil that that one was potted in, I did have a teeny tiny little bit of jewel orchid left in. And as you can see, it is bouncing back, which is good. I mean, it's nowhere near as beautiful and full as it was before, but it does give me hope. So maybe I haven't completely lost that plant, but yeah, so that's, that's the first update. Um, the second one, this was my big Anthurium clarinervium seedling, the one that was kind of the most well-established. It had loads of gorgeous leaves and I absolutely loved it. But while I was away, the moss just completely dried out. It was in my cabinet. And to be honest, that is, that's just my fault. I shouldn't have left it in my cabinet. It gets too hot in there anyway. And as you can tell, it's just completely dried up. All of the leaves have gone brown. I had to chop them back. And now I have a little stump in a pot. So, so yeah, I have rehydrated the moss and the roots are looking okay. So I'm gonna, I don't know, I might put some cling film over it and try and hopefully get it going again. But that made me very, very sad. Oh, I was gonna say those are the only deaths, but I've got one here that is a little bit iffy. Um, those are the worst two, but probably next on the list is my Labissia turtleback, which was an arid market import really, really recently. I did in my update video say that I was planning on taking some cuttings and propagating this plant, and I just didn't make time to do it before I went away. So this is, this is what I've come back to, which I am so, so, so sad about. The only encouraging thing is that underneath all these cracked dry leaves, there are some what look like little auxiliary buds, which I'm hoping could potentially mean that the plant is savable because I feel like at this stage, it's gonna be very hard to propagate those leaves. It's, it's not gonna happen. So I think what I'm probably gonna do with this one is completely chop it back, probably pot it up in soil. Some of you guys were saying that these ones tend to do best in soil as opposed to moss if they've got a good root system, which this one does. So I think that's probably what I'm going to do for this one. I think that's probably what I'm gonna do. I think you can do stem cuttings for this plant as well. So maybe I'll take some stem cuttings. Hmm, I don't know. Okay, that's that's that one. I'll get through them all first and then I will faff about and decide what I'm what I'm doing. Okay, let's let's go to one that's not not bad. Oh, I was gonna say as well, so this is the other drama that I've had. So the day before I went away, I found mealybugs in my cabinet and I was like, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do? If you don't know what mealybugs are, they're these white, horrible bugs that just feed on your plants. They're not something you want and I've actually never had them before and I was just really freaked out and I, I didn't want to go away because I was like I don't want to leave them so I basically took everything out of my cabinet and just tried to create little like isolation booths with plastic bags and stuff like that. I treated them with um, like rubbing alcohol that stuff which I think has done the trick. It's only been it's only been a week and a half so I'm still kind of very tentatively keeping an eye on them and hoping that they're okay. But this is the plant that it started on. This is my Philodendron Splendid. And oh my goodness, you guys know how much I love this plant. Otherwise it's doing really brilliantly, but I was just so sad when I found them and obviously not being able to be here to monitor it all the time. I was just like, ah. So what I did, I did basically exactly the same treatment as what I usually do for spider mites. I got a little makeup brush like this and I just dipped it in the rubbing alcohol mixed with some water and washing up liquid. I just gave all of the leaves, fronts, backs, stems, everything, a really, really, really good scrub kind of getting into all the nooks and crannies and 
so far I haven't seen any more so far it seems to have done the trick but I am keeping it out of the cabinet and far away far away from my other plants as much as I can at the moment until I'm kind of confident that they've gone and obviously just monitoring everything in there so 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 carefully but yeah one of the things I want to do with this plant today is I think I want to get it on a moss pole because it's as you can see producing some really really beautiful growth but it doesn't have anything to climb and oh my goodness if you look at those aerial roots can you see they're just going absolutely crazy they're literally looking for something to grip onto so I've made a couple of moss poles I here's some I made earlier I made them this morning and I'm going to try and get this and my varicosum on poles today so yeah that's that one this one is very 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 sad this is my Calathea lepidina and as you can tell she is just she's looking absolutely awful and i'm not surprised the heat in this room the fact that she hasn't been watered for a week and Calathea is like their soil kind of consistently moist and especially at this time of year when it's this warm she needs she needs extra moisture and extra humidity and i've not been able to be here to kind of do that for her so She's not looking very good. I do think, I think what I'm probably gonna do, I'm gonna repot her, I'm gonna check her roots, maybe give her roots a little prune to kind of encourage some new growth and then give some of her leaves that have kind of like browned and curled a little chop back just to kind of conserve her energy a bit. And then the other one that was doing so, so, so well before I went away, this is, it's a Skindapsis Silver Hero. I think it's a Silver Hero. I got it at the plant swap and it was looking quite curly when I first potted it up. And literally a few days before I went, it started to look really full. It started to look really, really healthy again. And since I've been away, this has happened and it's gone back to its curly state. So I think I might, I'm going to have a look at the roots on this one as well, but I think I might get this one into sphagnum moss just to kind of, I don't know, almost like put it back into the propagation stage. I'm not quite sure. I'm going to have to take a closer look at that one. Um, and then, yeah, I've just got some, oh no, I missed one. My anther oh, I've, I've missed a couple. Anthurium vichii. If you follow me on Instagram and you've seen my Instagram stories recently, this one has not been doing well for a while. And since I've been away, it's really, really, really gone downhill to the point that I'm not quite sure what I'm going to be able to do to save it. I'll talk you through the whole situation with it when we get to that plant because, oh, it's just been, it's been giving me so much grief. And then I've got a couple of just little repots that I want to do if I've got time. I've also got my Hoya pubicalix that I actually think now a lot of you have confirmed is a Hawaiian, a purple Hawaiian pubicalix. I think that's right. Um, but as you can tell, she's tendrilling quite a lot and I have actually finally got some wire so I'm going to make her a little trellis of some sort which should be quite fun. I'm quite looking forward to doing that. Also so many of you have been sending me pictures of your Hoya trellises that you've made for inspiration and I'm feeling very inspired so this is one thing that I'm actually really looking forward to doing so maybe I'll do that first or maybe I should get some of the other things out the way first. And then as I say, I want to give my varicosum, woo, I want to give my varicosum a moss pole as well. I've also got um, another cutting that I'm pretty sure, that's the varicosum as you can see, she needs a bit of support. Um, but I've got another cutting that I propagated that I think is probably ready to be potted up. So I think I might put them up together on a pole, but I'll see, I'll check the roots on that one and I'll see how it goes. And then lastly, I've got my Philodendron Milano Chrysum, which this one is totally, totally my fault, I think. So as you can see, she's lost all of her leaves down here. Before I went away, I had a feel of her soil and I kind of thought to myself, she's not quite ready for a drink, but in a few days time, she is gonna be. And do I take the risk or do I not? And I did water her and I don't think I should have done. I think I should have just let her dry out because I have a feeling she might have root rot and also she's definitely got fungus gnats and that is kind of a sign of the soil being a little bit too damp. I can see black flies flying out of her pot at the moment. So I've got some hydrogen peroxide on order, which I'm definitely going to need to use for this plant. So I think I'm going to start with the little curly Syndapsis Silver Hero. I, as I say, I'm pretty sure it's a Silver Hero, but I'm not entirely sure. can't remember. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to very carefully adjust the camera firstly and then I'm just going to empty out the existing soil and just have a look and see what the roots are looking like okay so she's got a fairly decent a fairly decent root system on her and it actually looks pretty healthy the stem just here looks like it might have started to rot a little bit 
I mean, actually not badly. It doesn't feel squishy or anything. It's more kind of twiggy, but I think that's kind of a potential spot where it could start to rot. So I think what I'm going to do with her for now, I think I'm just going to pop her in some damp sphagnum moss and kind of, as I say, get her back into like the propagating stage and just hopefully get some air and some humidity to those roots. And I really hope she'll bounce back. I think, I think she's going to be okay, but that's what I'm going to do for now. I did also ask you guys to send across some questions on Instagram as always, because I find it really fun going through and answering them while I'm doing stuff. So I'm just going to pull them up. I was just chatting away and I didn't realise that my phone died. So you've missed me potting up my, I think it's Synapse Silver Hero. I have just put it in sphagnum moss. I'm, yeah, I'm sorry about that. It's on charge now. So hopefully, hopefully we won't have any more issues. Um, I had started answering your questions as well. So I will, I'll go back over them quickly. Uh, someone said, my Hoya Carnosa tendrils have white spots along them, not bugs. I'll message you a pic. So... Uh, what I just said and what I will repeat, I got my uh, Hoya Crinklate to show you because I'm pretty sure, I don't know if you're going to be able to see on camera, but I'll put a clip in if not. If they're white bumps that kind of look like that, then that is absolutely nothing to worry about. They're just aerial roots and lots of Hoyas get them, lots of plants get them, but they are definitely more pronounced on some Hoyas than others. Like for example, my Hoya Parasitic Black Margin, I can't see them on at all, but this plant and some of my other Hoyas, they do look like just little white bumps kind of running along the main stem. And yes, they are nothing to worry about. The one thing that I did also just say, oh wow, plant's about to fall. The one thing that I did say as well is just, you obviously need to make sure it's not scale. Scale's not usually white, but scale's a pest and it basically feeds off the sap of your plant. So if they, if they scrape off when you kind of like scrape them, then I would say maybe pest treat your plant and just isolate it. But if they look anything like that, then do not worry. I feel out of, out of jig now that I have been cut off. I was on such a nice flow before. I think I might do this next because this seems fun and I feel like it'll get me back into my zone. <laughs> um, so I'm going to give my Hoya pubicalix Hawaiian, Hawaiian cross pubicalix. I'm going to give it a trellis and yeah, I'm, I'm quite excited. As I say, lots of you were sending me across pictures of the ones that you'd made and it was so, so, so useful because I kind of just have only ever seen them kind of as round things. And I feel like I kind of want to get creative and do like a, do like a cool one or something. Right, the next question is, if you were to start your entire collection again, what would you do differently? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, if I was to completely start from scratch, I think, I think I would definitely start with easier plants because when I first started getting into house plants, I just didn't even think about the fact that they had different care requirements and that some were going to be kind of needing needing different things, different lights, different water, all that sort of stuff. And I just went for ones that I really liked the look of. And I think I kind of overwhelmed myself a bit. And for that reason, I did lose loads of plants. I don't know how I'm supposed to get into this wire. Ah. Um, I did lose quite a lot of plants and a lot didn't make it. So I think if I was starting from scratch, I would start with ones that were fairly hardy, that I knew a bit about. I would do my research, which is something that when I first started, I did not do at all. And yeah, I mean, I kind of want to say take it slower, but at the same time, I'm kind of, when I really, really, really got into them, I'm kind of glad that I just went for it because I think I learnt a lot by by doing that, if that makes sense. That's probably off the top of my head what I would do. I don't know what I'm doing, by the way. I'm just literally pinging this wire about. Um, I think that is probably what I would do differently. But yes, that's, that's all I can think of for now. If I think of anything else, I'll come back to it. So, so these tendrils are very, very, very long and I'm obviously gonna have to wind them around this a little bit. I think I kind of want to do maybe like a spiral or like a little loopy bit. I don't know. I guess I can always change it, can't I? I'm going to get a fairly long bit of wire and these are the only wire cutters that I could find in the house. Look how rusty they are. I'm hoping that they cut it. Oh my God, it's going to be a bit tricky, I think. Okay, okay, it worked. What's the most amount of money you think you would spend on a plant that you like? Oh my goodness, that's such a hard question. I think it really depends on the plant. Like I, 
Although, yes, I love my rare plant collection, I equally adore my common plants. Like I've got some like my Marble Queen Pothos, for example, my Golden Pothos even, that I just am so obsessed with and they really didn't cost much money at all. I think when you kind of start really, really, really getting into rare plants and kind of, I, I don't know, they kind of become like art, like like really rare collectible art. And you know, like people spend thousands and thousands and thousands on, on rare art. I'm not saying I'd spend thousands on a plant. I definitely can't afford to spend thousands on a plant. Um, I can't say, I honestly can't say. I don't feel like at the moment I need to spend a huge amount of money on very expensive plants in order to make me happy because I'm really happy with the ones that I've got. And I, yeah, I, I, make, I like, I, there's loads of, look, 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 <laughs> there's loads of common plants as well that I don't have in my collection that I'd really like. So, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm being very vague with these questions, but I don't know the answer right now. Also, that's what I've made. I've made kind of like a spring and I'm not sure it's going to work, but I'm going to give it a go. I think I'm just going to, whoa, try and slide it under some of the vines. This wire is great though. Like it's really, really sturdy. I tried to just use normal garden wire the other day and it just, it was too flimsy. It wasn't going to hold. And I got this stuff off Amazon and... I'll link it in the description box, actually. It's really, really good. Does that feel secure? I think that feels fairly secure. Okay, I'm gonna just, I'm gonna start winding and hope that this works. Also, my friend Emma, who's good growing on YouTube, she said something a while ago, and I can't remember exactly what it was, but I think it was to wind the vines anti-clockwise or something like that, and I can't remember the reason behind that. And I'm pretty sure it was anti-clockwise, but I'm gonna do that anyway, just because maybe there's something I don't know, and maybe it will, maybe it'll do something. I don't know. Uh, I will ask her about that again next time I see her. But the next question is: If you could only choose to own variegated or non-variegated plants, which would it be? I mean, again, I absolutely love just like the normal, lovely green plants. Like I don't, I don't need my plants to be variegated. But then I think about my favourites again, both common and rare, and I think probably the majority of them do have at least some splashes of variegation, even if they're just really cheap ones. Like again, like I just said, the Marble marble Queen Pothos and stuff like that. I think I would have to go variegated, but there's lots that I still love. Oh, I just snapped a bit. Oh, damn it, that's annoying. Okay, I would just not wind them as tightly with the next ones. Um, but yes, I think I would have to go variegated if I had to say, but as I say, I've got loads here that are non-variegated that I really, really love. So. So yeah, as always, an indecisive answer from me, but that is that is what I would say right now. I should have also, if anyone's thinking of making a trellis and you want them to be kind of like the same length, I should have also measured the wire so that they could all be similar. Someone said, what's your biggest fear? Um, I guess the most obvious one, and I don't want to be afraid of them, but would be snakes. I'm really, really, really scared of snakes. I always try to kind of like desensitize myself a little bit, like. I held a slow worm recently and I survived. But yeah, for some reason, I've always been really, really freaked out by snakes. I think because they're just like one big long muscle. There was a point where I literally couldn't even look at a picture of a snake without jumping out of my skin. But yeah, um, my other, well, I mean, it's not so much of a fear nowadays, but when I was younger, I was absolutely terrified of, I mean, I guess it's a very logical fear, but being in a house fire, I was so, so, so scared of being in a fire to the point Oh my God, I can, <laughs> I can literally tie these two fears together. So I was terrified of having a house fire. So I lived in a top floor room in my mom's house with a big drop on the other side of it. And my mom got someone to come in and install like a rope that you could clip onto the wall so that if, if there was a fire or anything like that, you could, you could climb down the rope and be safe. And so anyway, that's that part. And then <laughs> my mum was away when, oh God, how old was I? 14, 13, 14, something like that. Um, and my mum was away and uh, I went downstairs and I was about to make something and right by the cooker, there was what I thought was a stick. And I went down to pick up the stick and my cat had brought in a slow worm and it was just lying straight along the mat. And I went down to pick it up and it moved and I just, oh my God, I freaked out. And I ran upstairs and very long story short, I tried to get loads of people around to help me, but, um, very long story short, I ended up having to use my escape rope and go down the house because I didn't want to go downstairs. 
so yeah that's those are my <laughs> my biggest fears right now this is looking a bit weird and now i don't know whether or not i should do another trellis as well or if i should just get these ones going around the same one I think I maybe might do one more. This is looking really weird and I don't think I like it. <laughs> I don't know if you can really see. I'm actually almost tempted to just, I think maybe I'm being a little bit over, over ambitious for my first trellis. Maybe I should just stick to a plain and simple circle one like I originally said. Damn it, that seems a bit boring, but maybe I should just do that. I'm gonna I'm gonna keep things simple because I I need to. My brain can't take any stress today. Right. Okay. Uh, the next question is, how are you? Yeah. Um. I'm okay. I'm all right. It's been um. I so obviously I've just got back from Torquay, hence all the all the planty things that need doing. Um, had such a lovely time away. It was, ah, oh, it was very well needed. It was so nice to have a bit of a break. Like things have been quite crazy recently and it was really, really nice. I've had some family stuff going on. Like um, my granny very sadly died recently. Uh, oh, I'm gonna cry. <laughs> Literally um, just before I went away. So that's obviously been very, uh, very sad but she was in she was in her 90s and it was definitely time to be honest I'm <sighs> hello again so I thought I'd pick up filming from here today I did carry on filming for probably about five more minutes I will probably have cut that bit by the time you watch this I don't know um but I just kind of realised that I haven't had a day at home since I went away to Torquay where I've been able to just kind of be with myself and not be doing something for other people or filming a video or something like that. And I just needed a day of just kind of tuning into myself, having a bath, snuggling with Yoli and just, yeah, kind of just processing a little bit. Um, and the reason that I said uh, in that bit, if I if I put that bit in, I don't know, uh, but I said something along the lines of um, it was the right time for her to go and in terms of my granny. And the only reason I say that is just because she was in her 90s. Her quality of life was so bad towards the end. And I think like part of me felt like I'd made peace with it because it was such a long time coming and because it wasn't her there anymore. She had dementia. She wasn't there anymore. And... I think sometimes you can kind of feel like you you are not going to be as sad about it when it happens because you've kind of dealt with the fact that they're not there anymore, if that makes sense. And I think this week has kind of been for me distract, 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 distract. And yesterday I was just like, whew, I was like, oh my God, it's just hit. So yeah, I didn't think it was the best time to carry on with that video, but I... I have woken up this morning and I feel like filming and so I'm gonna carry on. I might not be as chatty but or maybe I will be I don't know let's just see. Um, but so <laughs> I wasn't really I also just wasn't really taking in a lot of stuff that I was doing yesterday but my Hoya I still want to call it Hoya Gratzlis, Hoya Pubicalix Hawaiian whatever it is I did trellis it and then realised that I'd completely forgotten about the anti-clockwise thing, which I did look up and there is a reason for it because apparently the vines tend to tendril in an anti-clockwise anti anti way. So that is um, that is what I did. I unwound it and I wound it all up anti-clockwise. Um, and I mean, it's not as kind of like interesting as I maybe wanted it to be. I wanted to do a really cool one and... I've just kind of gone standard, like uh, just a round one, but I mean, I can I can redo it at some point if I want to. And I've got a lot of other Hoyas that also need trellising. So maybe I'll try something fancy with them, the ones that don't have quite as many vines. But yeah, so that's, that's that one out the way. That was a nice, gentle one to do. And I think, I think the first thing I'm gonna do today, as you can probably tell, it's the next morning and I haven't even got dressed yet. It's literally seven o'clock in the morning. I'm gonna, oh, pop that down there and then 
I think I'm going to try and get my varicosas on a moss pole because that was something that I know it's not maybe as urgent as some of the other ones, but I really like to just get them climbing and they're just so, so, so beautiful. And I think they look really lovely together. So yeah, I'm just going to have a quick look at the roots of this one. God, whenever they like properly attach themselves to the sphagnum moss, they're so hard to get out. Again, I know I forgot to put the camera down. Oh my God. Okay. I think... She's got some really good roots. <laughs> so the question yesterday that I didn't get through was, how are you? And I think, how is the move going? To answer the question more honestly, I, I, am, I am okay. Um, obviously going through some stuff at the moment, but on the whole, on the whole, I'm genuinely quite good. I think it's just... It is what it is. There's never a good time for these things. And I'm just a bit up and down. As I say, like, I think sometimes you can, you can prepare yourself to a certain extent for, for big things. And when they actually happen, they always end up affecting you in a way that you could never predict. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit uppy downy, but on the whole, life is good. I am in a fairly good place at the moment. And in terms of, I can't even find the roots. I can see that there's lots clinging on, but I don't know where they are. Uh, in terms of the move, yes, things are going ahead. I I don't want to kind of, I know I kind of jumped in with the last potential flat and was like, oh, it's going to be happening soon. I feel like this is going to be happening soon. Everything is looking like it's going to happen really quite soon, like in the next maybe few weeks, month. But it's just a waiting game and there's so many like, things, paperwork and all that sort of stuff that needs to be approved and gone through and all that sort of stuff. So I'm just, I'm, I'm waiting to hear and I'm really, really hoping it's going to go ahead because, oh my goodness, this new flat, the one that I'm looking at, it would just be, uh, as I've said so many times, it'd be so perfect for me, so perfect for Yoli, so unbelievably perfect for all my plants because it's literally got pretty much 360 lights. Like one side of the flat has got southeast facing, the other side has got northeast facing I think but it's just flooded with light and it's gorgeous so I'll keep you updated I'll definitely be doing some moving vlogs if and when it happens because moving everything is going to be it's going to be the biggest challenge and luckily my friend who also happens to be a handyman which is very useful has said that he will be able to transport my massive variegated monstera which was obviously my biggest concern so I'm really really glad about that and just hoping He's still suggesting I put it on the roof and the roof of his van and that's just not going to happen. So I'm, I'm thinking it should all be fine. So I think that's kind of the biggest update with me at the moment. So the roots aren't huge on this. Um, as you can see, they're not huge, but I think they should probably be good enough to be potted up like as you can see they are quite they are quite full oh now I'm dripping moss in my tea oh god right okay so now this one is also in sphagnum moss and because this one has got drainage on the bottom the moss does dry out quite a lot and quite quickly on this one so this might be a little bit difficult oh my god <laughs> so I don't know how well you can see but that is all root wrapped around the moss. I don't think I'm going to be able to fully untangle these roots without breaking them all. I think I'm just going to have to try and get as much of the moss off as I can and then put it up. The mix I'm using actually, I did pre-mix some soil that has got a bit of sphagnum moss in it anyway. So hopefully it'll just kind of blend in and the roots will start to kind of break free with time. Also going back to the questions from yesterday, someone said the easiest exotic looking plant to care for um, I personally would say like velvet leaf anthuriums, um, anthurium clarinervium. I've said that before, I think in one of my easiest plants videos a while ago. Honestly, it is such an easy plant to care for. It's so low maintenance. It just kind of likes being left alone to do its thing. You can obviously pollinate them as well and you can get berries for new little baby plants, which is great. But yeah, I would say if I had any suggestion, not just on like exotic looking plants, but just semi-rare plants, anthurium clarinervium would definitely be one of my recommendations because I've actually got three of them at the moment and 
they're just, they're so easy. I water them at the moment, kind of maybe once a week-ish, depending on the weather. And obviously it's quite warm at the moment. So yeah, I I would say that's probably my my top choice. But as I say, velvet leaf anthuriums on the whole, my anthurium crystallinum as well, that one's really easy to look after. The only thing I found with that is that its leaves can get stuck a bit easier than the clarinavium, just in my experience so far. I'll show you what I mean. So this beautiful new leaf here, as it was unfurling, as you can see, just got caught and it's ripped all the way up. So it isn't as kind of perfect as those leaves, which I mean, it doesn't really bother me, but it's maybe from that respect, like a little bit more challenging. I mean, that's not a care, a care thing at all, but it just maybe isn't as straightforward in doing its thing as a clarinavium, if that makes any sense at all. Right, this is a mission. This is an absolute mission. So I think what I'm gonna do controversially, I think I'm just gonna pop them like that. And as I say, I did make some moss poles yesterday morning and these are literally, I mean, I've made them in other videos before, but the easiest moss poles in the world to make. I've got some live sphagnum moss from Soil Ninja, which is so great. Honestly, it goes such a long way. I've had this bag for about three weeks and I've used it almost every day and I've still got moss left. And I've literally just done that with a bamboo cane, wrapped some string around it to kind of hold it in place and bish bash bosh, it's as easy as that. So that is what I'm going to use to stake them. And will this pot be, I think this should work quite well. Oh yeah, actually, I think that's going to look really pretty. I oh, can't really turn it. All of the varicosins I've ever had have pretty much just been one single stem and I would love to get a bushy one going. So I'm hoping potting these two together is going to be a really gorgeous full plant. The soil mix that I'm using, it is coconut core, houseplant soil, perlite, horticultural charcoal, sphagnum moss, and a few worm castings as well because I had some left over and it's just really nice and airy and I think that's gonna do them good. I'm thinking if I can make this moss pole a little bit thinner at the end, I can stick it through one of the drainage holes to kind of be a bit more secure. I always make such a mess, like honestly, such a mess when I film my videos. You guys only see this little area here, but usually when I finish, there's like muddy footprints on the floor because I'll have trodden in water and soil and bits of bamboo and moss and all sorts. So I usually have to spend about half an hour doing like a mass clear up after I filmed. Okay, I'm hoping that is thin enough to kind of poke through the bottom. So let's see. <laughs> Yay, okay. Okay, you can see it sticking out of the bottom there. And although that's obviously not gonna mean it's totally secure, it just helps to hold it a little bit so that when I'm filling the pot and whatnot, it's not gonna be falling, <laughs> falling everywhere. <laughs> the next question from the same person is, are cuttings worth it? Etsy ones often seem expensive compared to the grown plants. I'm, I mean, yes, cuttings are definitely worth it. I get so many of my plants as cuttings. I mean, it obviously depends on which seller you use, what the cutting is. Sometimes I have seen ones where I'm like, oh my goodness, I could get the full plants for literally a few quid more expensive. So there's no point in buying a cutting. But then again, like for example, on Etsy the other day, I saw a Philodendron Milano Chrysum cutting for about five pounds. And I was like, that's really amazing. Like big plants, or I mean, even like four or five leaf plants can go for 40 quid or something like that. So I thought that was a very, very, very good deal. It does just take some shopping about, like I've got some Etsy shops that I will always return to because I know that their prices are really good. I love the plants that I've got from them before. And on the whole, I much prefer, on the whole, although my recent actions may not reflect this, I do really like buying cuttings. I love growing things from cuttings. I love watching them grow from basically nothing. I love propagating plants. So yeah, I think cuttings are definitely worth it, but you just need to do a bit of shopping around sometimes in order to feel like you've got one that's good value for money, if that makes sense. Because I use Etsy literally all of the time for plants, for cuttings, for supplies as well. But it doesn't mean that every cutting you find is automatically gonna be worth it, if that makes sense. Like some people price things ridiculously expensively and other people will price things really cheaply, so, or reasonably. Okay, so I'm just gonna grab a bit of string just to kind of tie it a little bit and then hopefully as it attaches it'll just start to pull itself up and I won't need to tie it anymore but how beautiful does that look I think that looks so 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 pretty 
Also, I was going to say, I noticed this when I sat down to film this morning. I don't know if you can tell compared to yesterday, but my alocasia portadora, its new leaves are absolutely massive and they fold up at night. So now that it's first thing in the morning, they're still kind of folded a bit and they'll probably lower as, as I'm filming. But hang on, I'll pop the camera up so you can see it properly. Yeah, look how pretty that is. They just go all the way up and then in the daytime, they come down to get the light and then they go back up again at night. This varicosum here on the right, this one, I showed you, oh God, quite a while ago now, but probably a few months ago at least. But this is the one that I grew from like a teeny little wet stick and I'll put a clip in of it then because it has, it's grown so beautifully and actually in quite a short amount of time, it's produced some really gorgeous kind of quite mature leaves. They're starting to get beautiful as it goes up. Right, so yeah, that's how it's looking. And as I say, I think as it starts to grow up, it's gonna look beautiful and full and, hopefully turn into a really gorgeous bushy plant. I need to give it a water, but I will put it to one side and I will do that afterwards. And then while I'm adding moss poles to stuff, I may as well do the Philodendron Splendid, which is the one that had mealy bugs and is still at the moment looking fine. But as I say, I'm not gonna be putting it back in my cabinet. It's actually outgrown my cabinet pretty much now. It's got really, really big, but it is obviously a plant that is desperate to climb up something. So I made a bigger moss pole and I'm gonna I'm hoping that's gonna be big enough, actually. I think that might just be a temporary moss pole. Memo, who's the guy that I got this off at the plant swap, he did actually say that this one, I think he said it was quite slow. Did he say it was slow? Anyway, if he did, I have not found that so far. It's given me two leaves in the time that I've had it. And yeah, it's, it's beautiful. I absolutely adore it. And it has got, you can see them through the glass there, some really, really good roots on it. So again, I'm just gonna very, very, very carefully Ah, it's coming out quite nicely, that's good. Oh wow, yeah, it's got some gorgeous roots on it. You see around the bottom there. So I'm just gonna try and get a little bit of this moss off as much as I possibly can. The next question is, have you had any plants that you would never get again? I struggled with peperomia for years and years and years and I just didn't have any luck with them. Like I couldn't get them to like me and I killed so many of them and now I've got, I've got quite a few Peperomia now. I've got my Peperomia Frost, I've got my Peperomia Rosso. I got that beautiful Peperomia that I can't remember the name of. It could have been a Stereocarpus or something. In my last houseplant tour to Hutch houseplants, I've got Peperomia, I think it's Obtusifolia or something like that. I've got, I, I think I've probably got about seven different types of Peperomia and now I love them and they seem to like me. But I think a few years ago, I'd have said that's a plant that I wouldn't get again. I honestly don't know. Again, I've had plants that I've really struggled with in the past and now have like kind of found a good flow with. Like Skindapsis is another one. I had a lot of bad experiences with Skindapsis. Never know if it's Skindapsis or Syndapsis. I know people say it different ways, but I had really bad experiences with that plant. Um, and uh, Begonia, again, I've only got one Begonia in my collection and oh, I might have to show you her because she is flowering, hang on. So this was one of the nicer things to come home to. Look at those flowers, they're so, so, so beautiful. This is a Begonia albopicta. And to be honest, I've never been a very big Begonia person. And I kind of swore after my last Begonia that I kills that I wouldn't get another one. And this one just won me over and I absolutely adore her. So I would say Begonia. I'm, in fact, I just, I don't think there's a plant that I would be like, I will never buy it again, I think. There's some that maybe I just need to give a little bit of time to and like figure out my home, figure out my routine and then and then get them. But I can't think of I can't think off the top of my head. If anyone's got any that spring to mind for you, let me know in the comments because I'd be really interested to know. Maybe there's one that I'm not thinking of and I just don't know what it is. I don't know. I don't know. God, these roots, it's almost hard to tell what's moss and what's root. And I don't want to just keep pulling off the roots. It's so difficult when you've had something propagating in moss for ages to try and actually get all of the moss off it because it just becomes like a little maze and it's literally impossible. <laughs> also, I know some of you are asking um, why when I propagate in moss, I tend not to use something with drainage holes. I personally just really like to do it this way. I know some people wouldn't advise that. Like I would never leave it waterlogged at the bottom of the jar or anything like that. But for me, it just really helps to contain the humidity and like keep the moisture locked in, if that makes sense. And then when I rehydrate the moss, I'll just fill the container up with water, give it a couple of minutes and then just kind of pour it out like that so that it's all drained. And I just really like doing it that way. And I've had a really high success rate of doing it that way as well. And also on the whole, it means that the moss doesn't dry out as quickly, which 
just kind of makes it a little bit more low maintenance and yeah that is that is why i do it that way someone asked what do you do with pup plants is it best to put them straight in a pot um so i guess when you say pup plants just because i know some people say plug plants and pup plant plants plant plants plants um <laughs> and they're obviously two different things with pups as in the ones that naturally shoot up from the soil themselves like for example in like pilia peperomioides if they've developed in soil if they've grown in soil like the mother plant is in soil then I will personally plant them straight into soil. I guess when you separate them from mother plants, I would just always try and keep the environment as similar as possible to what it's been because then it doesn't kind of risk sending them into shock or anything like that. So if your if your mother plant is growing in moss, for example, I would probably pot the pups in moss. I don't know why I'm finding pups so hard to say. I would probably pot the pups in moss. Um, and yeah, that kind of, it goes for every substrate, but. In regards to plug plants, um, which are kind of the little ones, like kind of what my Alocasia Silver Dragon was when I first got it, like the teeny tiny little like baby plants. I I don't think that's this is what you meant, but I'm just gonna answer that anyway. Uh, I personally will always remove the netting around the roots. That is such an important thing to do. I know some people don't, and it just leads to so many issues further down the line. I actually did a video over on my Patreon last month of removing the netting from around my Pilia, pepper Pilia peperomioides roots. And since I've done that, oh my goodness, she has just gone crazy. I had her for probably about five months before I did that. And in the time since last month that I removed the netting, she has grown more than she's done in the entire five months that I've had her. It's absolutely crazy. So yes, but then also in regards to plug plants or like little baby plants that don't have a very well-established root system yet, I usually won't break up that root system at all. Like for the first, until they've kind of, got some mature roots for the first few times that I repot them, I'll usually just kind of keep them in their kind of like pot shaped soil and just put them straight into new soil. That's just me. I have just had like a bad experience before when I separated the roots and they were too young and fragile and the plant didn't make it. God, I'm waffling this morning. Um, but yeah, that's my answer to the question that you didn't ask. Do you prefer moss over perlite slash other propagation media or when does one thing or when do you use one thing or others? So I personally, so when I'm propagating like this, like how I have done here from like a cutting, a nodal cutting, I will almost always propagate in, I was gonna say perlite, that's light, sphagnum moss like I've done here. And just because as I say, I find it creates a really nice humid, airy environment for the roots and they tend to do really, really well. As I just said, I tend to use a glass or like a plastic container without drainage. That's just me. I find it works better that way. However, with my propagation boxes nowadays, I tend to use perlite. I used to be like moss all the way. And then I found that some things were starting to rot and touch wood. On the whole, I haven't really had that problem with my perlite propagation boxes. So that's what I do for that. Um, the one thing that I would say differently to that is seed germination. Like for example, Anthurium seed germination, when I make a propagation box for them, I'll almost always do sphagnum moss. And then ones that are just kind of quite easy, like pothos and stuff like that, um, syngonium, I tend to just use water and that works, that works really well. So yeah, I don't, I definitely don't have like a favorite. I think I've just got difference for different things, if that makes sense. Okay, I've reached a point where I feel like I just can't get any more moss off. I think that's the majority, but look at those roots, aren't they just gorgeous? I say that's the majority, I'm very aware that that is not the majority, but I keep accidentally snapping roots and I just don't want to risk snapping anymore. So I'm going to do what I did with the last one. I'm going to just keep a little bit of moss on them and I'm going to pot it up. Oh, it's just such a gorgeous plant. Look at that new leaf. Isn't that just so, so, so beautiful? I don't know why I'm holding it to the side. Isn't that so gorgeous? I love when the leaves are young on this one. They look very varicose to me. And then as they develop, they get darker and longer, like that one there. And oh, it's just such a gorgeous plant. Right, let's get it on a pole. I think this should be about right for now. So I'm gonna use this one. This one's got much smaller drainage holes on the bottom compared to the other one. So I don't think I'm gonna be able to do what I did before and try and stick stick the stick in. I might give it a little go, but I don't think it's gonna work as well. I mean, it kind of works. <laughs> let's just Let's just go with this. I think it's gonna have to just do the job as much as it can. I'm so excited to get this plant climbing. Like I've seen Memo's mother plant, who's the one that gave me the cutting. And 
oh my goodness, it is just absolutely stunning and its leaves are huge. So I'm really, really hoping that when this one gets going and has something to grip onto, she's gonna get really big and beautiful because at the moment her leaves are quite small compared to the mother leaf, which is kind of to be expected, obviously, because it was a cutting. It was a top cutting, luckily, but it was a cutting, but hopefully this is gonna work wonders for this plant. Right, and now I'm just gonna tie her. This is the only, I think this is the only wool I've got left. I always use wool to tie them for some reason, just because I find it kind of like blends quite well and you can snap it quite easily if you need to. This is gonna have to work. The stems kind of started growing at an angle, which ugh, you've always gotta be so careful of not to snap. Like you kind of wanna train it gradually instead of forcing it into one position. There we go. She's looking obviously a little bit wonky at the moment, but that's just because the stem is used to growing in a different direction. So I think I think the best thing to probably do is if I leave her somewhere where the light source is like there for a few days, then she should start to kind of straighten herself up. Her leaves will turn and then as she grows, hopefully she will start to grow a little bit straighter because she's all off at an angle at the moment. But yeah, I <laughs> she looks funny. Um, but yes, I think she'll be fine. And the other thing that I didn't even say with my varicosum, but what I'll always do when I use this type of moss pole, just kind of like a very standard DIY moss pole, is I'll just, on a very regular basis, as often as I water it, just to make sure that the aerial roots have got something to kind of grip on and attach themselves to, I'll just spray the areas where they touch the pole and it just helps them to stay hydrated, attach themselves, climb up, all that sort of stuff. Cool, I again will put her to one side and I'll give her a water after I finish filming. I'll keep you updated for this one and fingers crossed the next time you see her, she'll be looking a little bit more upright. So while I've got my potting mat out and I'm potting up, I think I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna pot up the Labissia turtle back just because I think that's really the only hope. As I say, quite a lot of you did say that they prefer kind of an airy soil mix if they've got a good root system. And the last time I saw this root system, it was looking fairly good, so I'm gonna have to trim her leaves back. I feel, oh, I feel so sad about this. I mean, I know she wasn't doing amazingly even in my update video, but I just wish I'd taken some cuttings before I went away. As I say, things just, things got a bit complicated and I ran out of time. So, so this is what she's like now. And I'm really hoping that her roots are gonna be looking okay. As I say, I do have some hydrogen peroxide on the way. It was meant to be here. It was meant to be here like five days ago and then the order got canceled and then I reordered and it's taking its time. So, so yeah, I mean, her roots, I'm gonna need to trim them back a bit. Some of them down here, they don't look sludgy, but they look, I mean, I get the impression that none of them are ever gonna look kind of really, really pale because the fuller ones here are kind of almost red but these little spindly ones here do look a little bit nasty. So I'm gonna give them a trim back. I have a feeling, yeah, I was gonna say, I have a feeling her leaves are just gonna pull straight off. Look at that, how sad is that? I'm so sorry, plants. And yeah, none of these, none of these are propagatable. They're all just crisped, crisped up. I'm gonna just take these off. As I say, she does have some kind of quite full looking auxiliary buds, so, I do think if I keep her in the right conditions, then now maybe I'm gonna have a second chance with this plant. I'll keep you updated, I'll let you know. But fingers crossed, pray for her, she'll be fine. <laughs> oh, doesn't she look pretty? <laughs> right, okay, I'm gonna just take some of the little spindly roots back. Actually, I said that they weren't actually that pale, but if you look just like at those ones there, if you can see past my shaky hands, they're looking all right, actually. So yeah, I'm just gonna trim them back a little bit. I know there's some people on here that really do not believe in roots pruning. I mean, obviously, aside from what I'm doing now, getting rid of the bad ones, but just in general, don't believe in root pruning. And that's the only time I've had comments on my channel that have been a bit like, why are you doing this? And I'm like, wow, okay. Um, but honestly, I have always personally found that root pruning really, really helps to encourage new growth. Like obviously not completely chopping healthy roots back, but just, giving them a little trim from time to time when you repot, just because, I don't know, it's kind of like pruning your plant in general helps to make it kind of fuller and bushier. The same applies with the roots. Like I think it genuinely helps to strengthen them and I have always done it and will always continue to do it because I think it works well. Okay, so I think everything that's left there now, although it's not a huge root system, I think I'm gonna have to use a fairly small pot, 
is looking in fairly good condition. So I think this, I think this is the best, the best chance this plant has. As I say, look at those little auxiliary buds. I think, I think it's gonna be okay. If it's not, and I will be monitoring it very, very, very closely now. If it's not looking good, then I might take some stem cuttings and maybe propagate that way. But for now, this seemed to be the general consensus when I asked you guys, and this is what you said to do, so I'm doing it. I need to find a fairly small pot. Okay, I think this should be okay. It could do with being maybe one size smaller, but with this bit coming out here, it would mean I'd have to chop that and that's got some nice roots coming off it. So I don't think I'm going to. <laughs> this is gonna be this is gonna be an attractive pot for a while, isn't it? The next question is how's Yoli? Yoli is really, really good, bless her. I don't know, I don't know if you'll be able to see her. She's over basking in the sunshine. Oh, can you see her behind the pile of stuff on the sofa. Yuli? Hello, good girl. Uh, yeah, she is always, well, pretty much always in here when I film my videos and she just sits and she watches and she's good. Yeah, she's she's doing very, very well. When I was in Torquay, she went to stay with, um, we found some lovely, lovely dog sitters because Yoli, as I've mentioned before, can be not a, not a difficult dog, but she's a rescue and she's come with a lot of issues and she can just be quite temperamental with other dogs and very anxious and it takes the right kind of people to look after her. But luckily we found some lovely, lovely people who also have a dog that Yoli gets on really well with. So she had a lovely little holiday when I was away too. But yeah, I'm just, as I keep saying, so excited to move and move with her and be able to give her a better life where she can just be off doing her own thing. If she wants to be in the room with me, she can be. If she doesn't want to be, she doesn't have to be. So. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully that will happen soon. Cool, okay, we're done. <laughs> I will give this a water. I think I'm gonna keep it in my cabinet again, just for humidity, because I know this one absolutely loves humidity. Keep it fairly warm and I really hope, I really hope, fingers crossed, I get some growth on this. I will keep you updated. And if anybody has any tips or any advice for this, do let me know in the comments because I would be so, so, so grateful. I really don't want to lose this plant. And oh, I'm just so sad. Those leaves were so gorgeous. Just, uh, as I say, they're just literally like, there's, there's nothing that can be done with them. So this is what we're going to have to do. But yeah, right, that is going in the watering pile. So, the next ones, which were, I mean, obviously the Calathea. Mm, I was gonna say I'll show you the other ones first, but maybe I'll do the Calathea first. Uh, <laughs> because obviously it's not looking great and I don't think it can really last much longer. So what I'm gonna do firstly, I know why this has gone like this. As I say, I went away, it was so, so, so warm. My humidifier also stopped working when I was away. So the humidity in the room dropped right down. And luckily, most of my other plants have been okay. This one obviously needs such high humidity and has suffered majorly, but her soil dried out and Calatheas hate their soil drying out. Oh, wow. Look at her roots though. I think she was definitely due a repot anyway. In fact, maybe first I'll just give some of the growth a bit of a trim back because obviously she's got a lot of very curled leaves, but some of them have started going quite brown like that there and stuff like that so I think I'm going to give her a really good chop back a really good repot put her somewhere much lower light up the humidity and hope that she bounces back I have rehabbed many a calathea in my time and a lot of them have looked a lot worse than this so I do have faith it should be fine but oh it's just so sad to see her looking like this she was looking so happy before I went away I'm apparently starting the repot before the trim so what is the next question? What has been the scariest moment of your life ever, not plant related? Oh my God. So I've had my biggest fear and scariest moment. Um, I mean, the slow worm incident was pretty scary. Let me think on that. Let me just grab a bigger pot for this and I will have a think. Okay, I've thought of a scary moment. Um, I don't know if it's the scariest of my life. Like that's a really, a very like a question that I feel like I can't just kind of answer straight up without having to actually sit down and think about for a while. So when I was about 17, 18, I was living in Turnpike Lane in London and I was walking home one night, probably at about 10 o'clock at night. And um, 
there was a woman on the bridge that I walked over to get to my house. There was a woman that came up behind me and she was like, I'm really scared, can I walk with you? And as like woman to woman, I was like, oh God, maybe something's happened to her. I was like, of course you can walk with me. And we started walking and as we started walking, I realized that she was totally just not with it. Um, she told me, she was telling me all sorts of stuff, but she told me that she'd just escaped from a mental institution, all this awful stuff had happened to her. Anyway, lots of things happened. I won't go into detail on my channel because I mean like, it's all a bit weird. Like lots, she she started being very strange. She started like showing me things. She said she, said she had a baby and um, showed me proof that she was breastfeeding, all sorts of stuff. Um, and basically, anyway, I was walking for her for a while and then I was thinking, okay, this is getting a little bit strange. Uh, I think I need to leave. I think I need to get home. And every time I try and leave, I, I tried to leave, she would like grab me and she'd be like, no, 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 walk with me, walk with me. And um, at one point uh, I saw a guy on the other side of the road and I was like, okay, I was like, I'm just gonna walk towards him and hopefully he'll see that something's not quite right and, and he'll be able to kind of like intervene in some way. And I started walking up to him and he, and I was kind of going like, mm. um, and he took out one of his headphones to like say something and she literally ran up to him and I won't use the exact phrase that she used on YouTube because I try and keep my channel fairly clean. But she was like, if you do, if you try and speak to her, I'll, I'll slit you. I was absolutely terrified. So I just kind of, I was with her for probably about an hour and I was like, I feel like if I try and run, like she was a fairly big woman. I was like, like as in muscly, I was like, I feel like she could probably outrun me. Um, so I just sat on the pavement with her and just kind of tried to humor her for a very long time. and just tried to listen and be very understanding and be like, no, 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 I'm on your side, I'm on your side. I also swore to her that I wouldn't call the police because she was making me um, like promise that I wouldn't tell anyone and everything. Uh, and eventually after, I don't even know how long, um, she was sat on the pavement and I just absolutely bolted. I just got up and I was like, fuck you, um, got home. And yeah, that, yeah, that was, I would say probably one of the scariest moments of my life maybe I don't know it was just a moment in which I was like there's no one around I don't know what to do like I couldn't yeah it was just not nice at all um so yeah I would say maybe that's one of my scariest moments I feel like and I was actually saying this to my mum the other day I feel like sometimes when stuff is so big you your brain kind of blocks it out a little bit like if we were talking about uh, a family member's funeral and I was like, oh my God, I was like, I don't even, I don't even remember that part. And like, I don't remember this and I don't remember that. And I think sometimes when emotions are so extreme, your body just kind of goes into, well, I mean like animal instinct, it goes into like fight or flight. And for that reason, you actually can't remember all the details. So yeah, I really like that question. And I mean, I love, I love hearing scary stories. If anyone's got one, again, do let me know uh, that you are willing to share, obviously, and it isn't like, um, traumatic or like yeah you know what I mean um but yeah I love I love hearing scary stories but yeah that's that's what I that's what I can think of at this time in the morning uh and it was generally very very scary god these roots I think because the soil's so dry these roots are an absolute mission I'm aware that I'm just kind of accidentally breaking them and I don't want to but it's also really hard not to the good thing is all of the roots are looking really healthy. They all look fairly full considering it hasn't been watered in a while and they don't look dry, they don't look sludgy. I think this plant's gonna be absolutely fine. It's just so sad to see it looking the way that it's looking at the moment. I was gonna say, I've got quite a few questions here from people asking about kind of specific plant issues and saying that they'll send me pictures and stuff like that. And um, I always, I really, really, really try to get back to messages that people send in about plants, like plants going wrong and stuff like that but I get quite a lot of them nowadays and I'm not like despite uh doing YouTube and stuff like that I'm really not that great on social media and I sometimes just find it a bit overwhelming having to go through loads of messages when I'm like ah I've got so much to do so I was gonna say I do I offer a plant doctor service on two tiers of my Patreon and basically the way that we're doing it at the moment is um anyone that's in the top top to like mi middle middle and upper tier um can email me at any time or speak to me directly on patreon or anything like that and you guys are always my patreons are always like the first port of call i will always get back to you guys and i'll always do my best to help and resolve any issues but yeah I, as i say i really do try and get back to people on instagram but i have just kind of had to let that sit on the back burner a little bit just because i don't have the time to get back to everybody at the moment because 
yeah thank you like thank you for messaging it really like i'm i'm glad that you reach out and i really appreciate it and as i say i will try and get back at some point but if you want like a quick response and there's things going drastically wrong and you want to kind of like chat it out then i do plant doctor on patreon <laughs> Okay, I feel like we're finally getting somewhere. I'm just kind of like hollowing out this bit here and it's all the little roots around the root ball that are really kind of clinging on, like all the little spindly roots. And these are the ones that I would say in terms of root pruning, you can afford to cut a little bit. In fact, I might, I might just make a few little cuts here. As I say, this plant's got a fantastic root system and losing a few of the spindly ones isn't going to be the end of the world. And I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be just fine. So that is, that's what I'm going to have to do. These roots are almost like a sleeve. Like it looks like I haven't done anything, but if you look, all of the soil is gone from the middle, but they're just kind of, yeah, they need, they just need breaking up and I can't get in there. Ah, there we go. Oh my goodness. It's such an unbelievably satisfying feeling when you break through really tough roots and you start kind of getting them detangled. It's just like, ah, oh, so satisfying. <laughs> Do you prefer trellis hanging or straight growing plants? Um, right now, I would say probably hanging, just because again, like the place that I'm moving to, it's basically got pretty much all sloped ceilings. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, like it has got a point in the middle where some of my big plants can grow up to, which is so exciting. Um, but most of the sloped ceilings, I'm thinking I'm gonna have to do loads of hangers. So I'm trying, I haven't done well in the last week, but I'm trying not to get too many more that need things like moss poles and stuff like that and are gonna have to kind of go upwards. Oh, I don't know. I mean, like for example, my variegated monstera is obviously a very upright, very tall plant. And oh my goodness, I love that plant so much. And I've got so many on moss poles that grow up that I love, but I just, I don't know. Like I always feel like I love jungle homes when I walk into someone's house and they've got loads of trailing plants coming down from the ceiling. I feel like that just kind of like, makes it feel even more jungly, if that makes sense. So right now I would say hanging plants and I, yeah, I've got some gorgeous hanging plants. I really do absolutely love my hanging plants so much. Maybe I'll do a hanging plants tour at some point. If anyone would like to see that, let me know. At the moment, that is the only type of plants-ish, that, well, the only plant that I plan on buying right now would be hanging plants because I've got so many upright plants, plants that need staking, plants that need trellising, like my Hoyas and stuff like that. And to be honest, I've got a lot of my Hoyas still as hanging plants, like um, behind me, you can't really see, but my uh, Hoya Super Silver there, my um, Hoya, uh, what's that? Crimson Queen, what's my hand doing? <laughs> my Hoya Crimson Queen just there. A lot of them do need trellising and they are just hanging at the moment, but Trellis would probably be bottom of the list for me and then upright and then hanging at the moment at least. Okay, right. I would say that's looking fairly good. There's obviously a little bit of, I think it's just core they're planted in at the moment, um, but there's a little bit around the roots, but not enough to kind of, there we go, let me just do that a bit. <laughs> not enough to stop me repotting it. So I think I'm just gonna use the same mix. I mean like this is maybe not the typical mix I'd use for a Calathea, but it has got coconut core in there perlite. I think that mix will do fine. I think that's going to do fine. Right, as usual, I'm going to just clear off at the end and just push that all to one side. Also, the worst thing is I know I've got my potting mat out at the moment. It's folded in half and I went to completely fold it out and I've still got soil in there from my last repot and chat, which is, or repot and chat, I don't know if it was that, the last time I repotted a plant and couldn't be bothered to get rid of the soil. So I do need to do a pretty huge clean up today. I think, mm, Maybe one size bigger than that would actually be better. I'm running really low on pots and, aha, I see one. Now I think this, ooh, look at that spider's web. Also, I don't know if anyone's scared of spiders. I'm actually not scared of spiders, but we've had loads of, um, you know, there's false widow spiders. So over here in the UK, we don't tend to get black widows or anything nasty like that, but we've had loads of false widows, which basically look just like them all over the place. Like I've had quite a few in here. Ooh, uh, I say I don't mind spiders. I still don't want them on me. Um, but I'm always the one that's like rescuing spiders if anyone else is gonna kill it. I'm always like, no, I'll take it outside. And my friend was sitting on the sofa the other day and suddenly I was like, oh my God, get up, get up, get up. And this huge, like I would say no exaggeration about that big black false widow spider just was like running towards him. And I was like, get up. 
and it was horrible. It was really, really horrible. I mean, those are the sort of things you would not want to get bitten by. Oh, there's actually a spider in a web in there. Not a false widow, luckily. Uh, and also I think that plant pot would be, yeah, that would be too big anyway. Right, okay. Sorry to disturb you, back you go. I'll take him outside afterwards. So what I have got, I've got this, it's actually a hanging pot, but it's a lot kind of shallower. So maybe I could spread the roots a little bit in that. Um, I think, yeah, I think that would work actually. I think that would work quite well. I think that's what I'm gonna have to do because that's just not quite big enough. I mean, it would be a case of repotting the plant probably in another month or so. So I think I'm gonna go with this one and I think I'm probably gonna have to mix up a bit more soil because I'm running a little bit low. And I'm gonna go and add water to my perlite outside to put it in here just because I don't want the dust getting in my face. I know I have said this recently as well, but I always nowadays take my perlite outside if I want to pour it or into another room or something like that, just because the dust is so, so, so bad for you to breathe in. I didn't realize how bad it was for ages and I was just pouring it indoors and breathing it in and coughing and it's awful. So yeah, I'll take it outside into another room and then I'll just water it down so that it doesn't make any dust. It does mean that your repotting is a little bit messier, but I mean, it's better than having that stuff in your lungs. What's the next question? Terracotta pots, yay or nay? I, I use a combination. I use mainly plastic pots, if I'm being completely honest, but I've got probably about maybe like 15, 20 plants in terracotta. And terracotta is just amazing for loads of reasons. But I mean, if you're, if you're quite prone to overwatering, then terracotta is incredible because it helps to absorb some of the water that you pour into the soil. So if you know that you're prone to going a little bit overboard, it can be a really good way to help regulate this. I know a lot of people use it for succulents, like for that very reason, because it means that if you do give them a bit too much water, because it's a porous material, water will kind of like pass through it a lot easier. I do obviously sometimes accidentally overwater plants and stuff like that, but on the whole, with a lot of them now, I've got used to what they like. And like, for example, I recently actually transferred my Alocasia Silver Dragon into a terracotta pot, and I'm now just a bit like, oh God, I'm gonna need to water her way more than I was watering her before because she likes a fairly consistently moist soil anyway. And yeah, it just means that watering is gonna be a lot more frequent. Um, but sometimes if you need to move up a pot size, like if you've only got a big terracotta pot or like a small nursery pot and you need to move up a pot size that's maybe a little bit too big, then using terracotta can be a really good way as well because if the pot's too big and the roots aren't gonna be able to absorb all the water from the soil, then sometimes using terracotta can help. So yeah, I mean, I think, I know some people use them for absolutely all of their plants. I think if I was to use them for all of my plants, I would be watering non-stop. I've got, I've got a lot of plants. If you've got the time to do that, then great. But for me, I, I don't have time. I mean, I spend, God, with the weather as it is at the moment, I spend a lot of time watering as it is. Like I usually like part of my, part of my morning routine and I do absolutely love it. But is always coming through here, spending some time with my plants, doing any watering that needs doing, pruning, pest checking, all that sort of stuff. But if I did, if I did a full water of my plants start to finish, especially because I bring every single one of them over to me to water instead of going to them, I think it would probably take me about five hours, maybe. I don't know. That uh, yeah, I think it would be about five hours. I was going to say when I first got back from Torquay, I think about 90% of them needed watering and getting through that took me at least three and a half, four hours. So, so yeah, <laughs> I'm just gonna wash my hands. Okay, and now I'm just gonna go ahead and chop back any of the kind of browning, curling leaves, any that aren't looking, any that aren't just curled. Cause I think after I've given her a good water and some humidity, then she hopefully will bounce back. But what I'm doing is I'll just cut as like as close to the base of the stem as I possibly can. If it's a leaf that's got new growth coming up from it, then I'll obviously cut above that. But yeah, I'm just gonna try and get rid of as many of those as I can. What I'm seeing is actually a lot of the new growth that's coming up, like that one was coming out of that leaf. That's the stuff that's actually browning, which is such a shame. I do feel so bad. Like. I really do think next time I go away for more than a couple of days and it's and it's this hot, I need to get a friend to come in and kind of like at least monitor my plants like once. 
The good thing is, as I say, giving your plants a really kind of serious, serious chop back from time to time does help to encourage even more new growth. So I'm really hoping, although she's probably going to be looking a little bit bare for a while, when she does kind of bounce back, then she'll be she'll be doing even better. So let's just keep our fingers crossed for her. Fortunately, there's no sign of pests or anything like that, which is such a relief, especially knowing that they have been in this room fairly recently, just because calatheas are, oh my goodness, unbelievably susceptible to pests. I've had pests on this plant before, and obviously she's she's doing okay now, but they, oh my goodness, they're like a magnet for pests. Like spider mites, thrips, I'd say they're probably like the worst too, but yeah, I've had scale on a calathea before as well, which is very, very weird. Like usually they go for kind of a bit more like stemmier, stemmier, I mean kind of like firmer plants. Plants with firmer stems. I think that's what I'm trying to say. I think, I think, 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 think. That's, that's about, yeah, that will do okay for now. I'm gonna go and give her such a good water and as I say, put her somewhere in kind of medium light, so much humidity and hopefully, hopefully the next time I show you her, she'll be looking a lot fuller, a lot healthier. The last two things I was gonna do were my Milano Chrysum and my Vichii, but both of those I really do think I'm gonna be needing hydrogen peroxide for, and I'd kind of like to do that in a video. So yeah, there's not a lot I can do about that right now. So I think I'll probably finish this video here and do kind of like a continuation of it in a few days time or something like that. But yeah, I really hope that you enjoyed this video. I'm sorry for the stoppy startiness, uh, the two stoppy starties and the fact that it was a little bit disjointed maybe compared to some of my normal videos. But yes, I really hope you enjoyed it. If anyone's got any comments or questions, drop them down below and I'll get back to you. If you did enjoy this video, please make sure to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to my channel, have a lovely day and I'll see you in the next video.